Well, thank you very much. And uh, um, everything you just went through is incredibly impressive relative to the work you're doing here. And it's a, a great pleasure to be here uh, this evening. And by the way, when we talk about just before I even turn to this material, I might say something about Brookfield and, and its history of Brookfield in the area of sustainable development. The predecessor company to Brookfield was known as Brasscan, headquartered in Toronto. And uh, they had operations in mining, forestry, petroleum, utilities. And uh, it was the first environmental report ever written, period, was written in 1989 with, uh, by Brasscan, a Brookfield predecessor company, on um, um, sustainable development applied to mining. And that was in 1989. And the person that really led Brasscan and Brookfield and educated them on the subject of sustainable development, starting in about 1989, 1990, a couple of years after the Brundtland Commission report came out, was a person by the name of uh, Dr. Frank Franizak. He was the leader in the world on sustainable development very early on. Uh, he's now uh, 91. And he's uh, one of my best friends. As a matter of fact, we're having breakfast at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. And Frank, at 91 years old, sends me articles twice a week to read and, say, and, and saying to me, how come you're not doing more to help about this or help about that and so forth? So hopefully the journey you're on relative to the realization and mobilization of sustainable development will be as long as Frank's. You know? And Frank is still going strong, believe me. So having said that, very pleased to be here uh, this evening to talk about weather, one, weather Gone Wild, Building Right for Climate Change. Or in other words, when things go wrong along the lines of that which you see depicted in these pictures, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, too much water in the wrong place causing flooding at the, the community level, down to including uh, water filling the basements of homes. And you can see this poor person sitting there with a, a foot and a half of uh, sewer water in her basement. Or we may have problems with um, uh, forest, uh, with fires affecting communities in forested and grassland regions, obviously having a significant negative impact on um, homes, businesses, uh, communities in, in these regions. Or we may have extreme heat that at its worst, when extreme heat is really extreme, people can die from it. When these types of events occur, um, how well prepared are we, and I'm gonna talk mostly about Canada, but pretty much everything I say you can extend to the rest of the world. How well prepared are we as a society for these extreme weather events? And by the way, for the Intact Center on Climate Adaptation, the name of our organization, so we're housed within the Faculty of Environment, at the University of Waterloo, um, our focus on the climate file is adapting to, how do we adapt to climate change and extreme weather risk? Um, that's not to suggest that mitigating greenhouse gas emissions isn't a really good thing to do. But when we started our work with the Intact Center, more or less about 15 years ago, 97% uh, of the discussion about climate change in the country or globally was focused on mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, and so a, a good thing to do. But almost no attention paid to, but how do we adapt to the extreme weather risks that you're, you're seeing on the news now all, all, almost nightly. So we thought, look, at, we can't add anything to the discussion about mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. There's lots and lots of smart people in the country and globally working on that file but almost nobody addressing adaptation. So our focus is purely on adapting to climate change and extreme weather risk, but I don't want that to be interpreted as we don't think mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, you know, we realize fully that that, that is important. So, and, and by the way, the th three perils that I'm gonna talk about in terms of preparedness for climate change, extreme weather risk are flooding, wildfire, and extreme heat. However, that's a subset of a much longer list of perils that I uh, uh, could be talking about. The longer list includes flood, drought, fire, hail, wind, snow load, permafrost loss, sea level rise, contraction of Arctic sea ice, and extreme heat. Those are pretty much the 10 perils that are impacting Canada today uh, with varying degrees of applicability to, depending on where you 
where you are in the country, depending on the geography. However, we're going to focus on three perils, flooding, wildfire, and extreme heat, because with flooding and wildfire, these are the two perils that cost Canada the most in financial terms when things go wrong. The number one, the, the peril that's most costly to Canada is flooding. And the aspect of the peril that's most costly to the country is residential basement flooding. The, the upper right hand corner there, the person sitting in that with the, the sewer water in her basement, that's the number one cost of climate change in Canada, basements flooding. The second most expensive peril is wildfire. So that's why tonight, with limited time, we don't have endless time, um, uh, I'm going to focus on how we prepare for these two risks. With extreme heat, uh, when extreme heat goes wrong, it's not financially costly, but in the worst case scenario, large numbers of people can die. In 2021, we had an extreme heat event in uh, British Columbia uh, that killed 619 people. They died prematurely. In 2018 in Quebec, we had an extreme heat event where 86 people died prematurely due to extreme heat. And by the way, under both of those uh, conditions, people died under quote unquote good conditions. The electricity was running. Had there been an elongated electricity outage coincident with those heat events uh, where fans and air conditioning would not be running, uh, those deaths would have gone up easily into the thousands. And it's just by dumb luck that the electricity kept going during uh, those two heat waves. So the logic as to why we're focusing on, on these th three perils is we have the two most financially costly and then the most lethal. So that's why I'm zeroing in on those. Um, next slide, please. Now, just to give you a bit more sense of where we're going to go, um, in one slide beyond this, don't turn, the, uh, I'm going to talk about our purpose here and how this material fits in to the work you're doing, building, designing and building sustainable communities of the future. Uh, uh, physical climate change, extreme weather risk has to function into the work that you're, you're, you're engaging. So, and I'll just drive that point home a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, then I'm going to turn to documenting the costs of climate change. The costs of climate change, the, the stuff you see on the news at night, are going up, and they're going up rapidly. They're not just going up, they're going up curvilinearly. And the best way to, to, to depict this is to show you the catastrophic loss insurable claims data uh, being realized, uh, paid out on an annual basis. You plot it out, and things aren't going in a good direction. But it's a it's a metaphor for the risk that's in this. It's both it both is it's representative of the risk that's in the system, and it's a metaphor for the risk that's in the system. Uh, then I'm going to uh, 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 oh, and I, uh, I missed point number two. I don't know why I missed it, but I missed it. Anyhow, I'm also going to document the point that climate change is real and it's irreversible. Period. Climate change is here to stay. We're not going backwards on climate change. By mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, we can slow down the rate of change, but we're not going backwards. So I just want to drive that point home. So we'll look at the fact that climate change is irreversible. The costs are going up. Uh, though when we cover that material, I can tell you right now, it's not going to put you in a good mood. You know, it's, not, it, it's kind of depressing, quite frankly. But then we turn to something that's a bit more positive, and that is, over the period of about uh, uh, more or less the last 10 years or so in, in Canada, we've developed good guidelines and standards that can be practically, meaningfully, and cost-effectively applied to mitigate risks due to flooding, wildfire, and extreme heat. And I want to, I'll cover that a little bit. And then at the end, I'm going to turn to Canada's newly launched national adaptation strategy to perhaps elevate your awareness of the national adaptation strategy. How many people here, just by way of show of hands, put up your hand, are familiar with Canada's national adaptation strategy? Okay, one person going like this. So in other words, that's not good. The, uh, well, number one, it's good that we're going to cover it. But uh, last year in June or July, uh, 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 Canada launched its national adaptation strategy, which is basically the document saying, this is how we as a country are going to adapt to climate change and extreme weather risk. The focus is on flooding, wildfire, and extreme heat. It was launched by uh, uh, Minister Gilbo, the Minister of Environment and, and Climate Change. So more or less six or eight months ago, there are 26 targets in the National Adaptation Strategy, 10 of which Canada is meant to meet in, the, uh, in 2024, 25, and 26. So I just want to say a little bit about that and how your work 
will contribute to Canada realizing success in meeting the targets presented in the National Adaptation Strategy. So that gives you a sense of uh, where we're going to head. Uh, next slide, please. This is probably obvious, but nonetheless. Uh, the way I see our purpose here tonight, or at least my aspect of the, the presentation, is, is this. For those who design and build sustainable communities of the future, those who build sustainable communities of the future must take climate change and extreme weather impacts of today and the greater threats to come into account. Climate change, extreme weather risk should factor into your work going forward, whatever aspect of sustainability you may be pursuing. Um, and the reason for that is we're not going backwards on climate change. It is irreversible. And number two, when we build structures going forward, we've got to build for the long term. The cap capital stock turnover on the infrastructure can be 50 to, say, 75 years. For example, when you build this building, uh, you may be building it in a place today that's not subject to flooding. So that's good. However, how do we know that 25 or 50 years down the road that this area isn't going to be subject to flooding as driven by climate change? So you not only, you want to build right for the present and in anticipation of the future because climate change is going to continue to happen. Very often um, on the news at night, you'll, you'll see extreme weather report it and reporters and others will use the words like, this is the new normal of the weather. There is no new normal. It's just going to be evolving risk. And, um, and, and by the way, even making that point so stridently, uh, there are some people think, geez, you know, it's kind of kind of depress people and maybe turn them off and so forth. You got to lighten the load a little bit. My personal feeling on presenting facts is that to not overstate or understate the reality. It's to present it as you best understand it and then deal with the reality. So, uh, next slide, please. Starting with the first point first, climate change is irreversible. The se severity of extreme weather will increase as, as driven by uh, changing climate. This isn't just my cavalier opinion. This is an opinion expressed by many authoritative agencies around the world, both within Canada and around the world. For example, on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, you see Canada's Changing Climate Report 2019, the new version of which is going to come out in uh, next year, 2025. But in that report, which was written by uh, a scientist at Environment and Climate Change Canada, about, a 12, about, about 12 climate scientists more or less, in that report, they actually make the statement, and it's in italics in the lower left-hand corner, and I'll read it. It's in italics because it's, uh, uh, it's the, the words are taken directly from the report. In that report, they say, Canada's climate has warmed and will warm further in the future, driven by human influence, which is the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. This warming is effectively irreversible. And that's the first time, at least the first time I'm, I'm aware of, that the, the federal government recognized that, that climate change is, is, is here to stay. And in the middle of the uh, slide, we see a report by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that came out just about a year and a half ago. And in that report, they state, it is indisputable that human activities, the burning of fossil fuels, are causing climate change, making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall and droughts, more frequent and severe. And then most recently, uh, from the United Nations Environmental Program in a, a report that came out just very recently, they said there's no credible pathway to holding the Earth's temperature at 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, warmer than the historical past. So that's the reality we're dealing with. And by the way, um, um, the, the fundamental driver, the thing that's driving uh, climate change and, and continue, right, right, right now on the planet, about 78, 79% of our world energy supply as of this moment comes from about a third, a third, a third, coal, oil, and natural gas. That's where we get our energy on the planet from fossil fuel based sources. And it's about 78, 79%, a third, a third, a third, coal, oil, natural gas. As we engage efforts, as, as driven through COP conferences and the Paris Accord and efforts to move towards net zero, which we should be doing, uh, we will lower the percentage contribution of 
coal, oil, and natural gas to world energy supply. However, so we'll get it down from 78, 79% over the next couple of decades down into the mid 70s, perhaps lower. However, the total carbon footprint on the planet will increase. And the reason it will increase is growing population on the planet. Right now, the world's population increases as of this moment by more or less by about 8,000 people per hour. Every single hour, if you subtract deaths from births, there's 8,000 more people on the planet, which amounts to about 70 more people, 70 million more people per year, which means by 2035, 2037, somewhere in that zone, there's going to be another 1 to 1.1 billion, billion more people on the planet than the 8 billion people we currently have. And we have to feed, house, clothe, educate, provide energy to these people. And that's the reality that's on the table. So I'm a big fan of working to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, but also adapt to the extreme weather risk that's going to be realized going forward. Uh, remember I said earlier that this is like very depressing at the beginning. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the depressing part. Next slide, please. Now, when we, when we talk about extreme weather risk, you know, this isn't some ethereal concept. So I'm just I'm going to give you one example of the manifestation of extreme weather risk. Um, obviously, here you're looking at a map of the United States. Uh, the data that's on the map, uh, uh, we have this data for the United States. We didn't have it for Canada, but it's pretty easy to imagine that on the north side of the border here, that the numbers would be exactly the same. And wh what you're looking at here are is over the last 60, 70 years or so, uh, changes in the intensity of precipitation events for the top 1% or the, the uh, 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 severity of, of uh, extreme precipitation events. So what? So in other words, when we have rainstorms, the kind of storms where the water just bounces off the pavement, so to speak, what is the change in the intensity of the water, amount of water coming down for, through those extreme events over the period of the last 60 years? And you can see, so that's what these numbers depict, Towards the western end of the Great Lakes, the increase is about 37% greater intensity for the top one, uh, the top percent of uh, precipitation events. Towards the eastern end of the Great Lakes, the intensity is increased to by about 71%. So, if for some of you who, well, most of you are younger, but for people with older, older like me with a bunch of gray hair. It, you know, I can have the perception that when I was younger, the intensity of precipitation events wasn't as great as it is today. Well, it turns out that that view is actually borne out in the data. So there's lots of manifestations of extreme weather risk uh, uh, driven by climate change, warming on the planet, manifesting themselves. This contributes to flooding because the systems that we have designed, the systems we have in place to take water away from areas of a development, they're not used to this volume of water coming down over such a short period of time. Uh, next slide, please. Now, what do the costs look like associated with climate change? So what you're looking at here are the um, catastrophic loss insurable claims realized in Canada over the period along the x-axis in the lower left-hand corner from 1983 up to and including to 2023. And uh, uh, catastrophic loss insurable claims, if you're not familiar with the term, which why would you be? Uh, in insurance terms, a catastrophic event is any event like a flood, wildfire, windstorm, hailstorm, whatever it might be, if it triggers more than $25 million in insurance claims, that event gets, that's, gets captured on this, this chart and, and the total costs in a given year are plotted out as per the red bars. And by the way, all the um, uh, information, all the data on this chart has been corrected for both inflation and for per capita wealth accumulation. In other words, if you were insuring twice as many homes today as you did 10 years ago, uh, you would expect the insurance claims to be twice as high simply because you're insuring twice as many homes. That phenomena has been factored into or out of this data, uh, data if, if you will, such that horizontally, we're looking at a, comp uh, uh, a, a comparison of apples to apples in the data. And what's notable here is that from 1983 up to 2008, the insurers in Canada, the insurance industry in Canada, 
could count on paying out between about 250 and 450 million dollars per year in insurance claims. But everything started to change on or about 2009 onwards, whereby for 14 out of the last 15 years, the insurance claims have gone over a billion dollars per year, every year for 14 out of the last 15 years, for an average cost of just over $2 billion, about $2.1 billion. The culprit that's driving most of the upward bend in this curve is too much water in the wrong place, flooding. So as I mentioned earlier, flooding being the number one cost of climate change in Canada, and specifically residential basement flooding. And uh, now it's at the point where, um, um, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, some of the bullet points here I'll walk through, we now have 10% of homes in Canada, of residential homes in Canada, are no longer insurable for flood risk. People can't get insurance for their homes for flooded basements. That's 1.5 million uh, uh, Canadians. And by the way, the average cost of a flooded basement is about $43,000. So if you own a home and your basement floods and you with the average flood and you don't have insurance coverage, you have to come up with $43,000 instantly to put your home back into working order because this is not discretionary spending. This is sewer water in your basement. So it's really nasty stuff, in other words. And um, uh, so if you flood on a Monday morning, you have to solve the problem for that house by Wednesday of that week or the house is uninhabitable. Um, the, uh, right now with fire risk, by the way, the, um, I don't know if you followed over the last uh, year or so, but you'll see in California, um, all state and state farm insurance have stopped writing new insurance for wildfire, home wildfire insurance uh, in California. They're not writing any new insurance because the risk of wildfires now is so high, they can't charge a premium that anybody could ever afford. Uh, in Canada, uh, maybe not so much behind closed doors, but discussions are being had for parts of uh, uh, Northern Alberta and British Columbia as to whether or not there's certain uh, regions there that uh, insurers may pull out of in, in reference to offering uh, uh, wildfire, uh, fire damage for homes. Because the risk of fire is getting so high, they can't charge a premium that homeowners uh, could afford. This is very problematic because um, if you own a home and you don't have flood insurance, you can still get a mortgage. But without fire insurance, you cannot get a mortgage. So I'm also advisor to the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation on climate change matters. And a little while ago in meeting in one of our meetings in whatever city we were in, um, uh, we talked about this phenomena and I've got all the major banks in the country with the executive vice presidents who run the mortgage divisions of those banks sitting in front of me. I said, you know, so what is the plan for um, uh, uh, the mortgage division of your banks if uh, you can't, uh, if people can't get fire insurance and can't renew their mortgage, and the room just goes quiet, like the answer is nobody knows. So um, the uh, uh, over the last six or eight years, insurance premiums have gone up about 20, 20 to twenty to twenty five percent, primarily due to flooding. The amount of coverage, if you can still get coverage, is coming down for the equivalent amount of uh, premium. In major cities across Canada, over the last 10 years, when you watch the news at night and you see flooding in communities, and you look at houses in communities that are flooded out, it doesn't take much to figure out that, well, that's not good for housing value. But the question is, is there an impact on the actual sold price of homes if they're in communities that flood? And we went through a, a, a rather difficult uh, study to, to conduct but we figured out a way to get the data in terms of what homes sold for in multiple communities across Canada over the last 10 years that experienced significant flooding. And we had nearby communities as control communities that weren't flooded. And looking at the two comparatively, we could look at the change in housing prices in flood uh, for, for the sold price of homes in flood impacted versus non-flood impacted communities. And what we found is that if you owned a home in a flood impacted uh, community over the last 10 years in Canada, that home sold on average for 8.2% 8, 8 less directly attributable to flooding 
as compared to the sale of homes that weren't in communities that were flooding. Um, my point here is really to, to, to drive home the point, in, in this case, in reference to flooding, the severity of the situation. But when you look at this data, don't just think of it as an insurance issue. Think of this as a metaphor for risk that's in the system. It's not like, for example, the insurance industry is getting hit really hard, but everybody else is just perfectly fine. You, the, the risks are also there for mining, forestry, petroleum, util utilities, hospitality, telecommunications, tourism. Every single industry sector is being hit hard by climate change. They need to prepare for it. I, the reason I show the insurance data is simply because this is the industry sector for which we actually have data. We don't have the data for the other industry sectors, but it's not like this industry sector is getting hit hard and all the others are just perfectly fine. So, for people with your background who design and build for the future, no matter what sector you go into, you need to take physical climate risk into account and ask yourself, where, where are the manifestations of physical climate risk and what do we do to prepare for it? Uh, next slide, please. So on the last slide, and up to now, I've mostly been talking about the financial costs of climate change. And by the way, pretty soon we're going to get to the good stuff, like the, it's more uplifting. So the, the, um, um, we also ran a, 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 a test or a survey, if you will, uh, of the amount of anguish or psychosocial stress people realize uh, if they have a house that's been flooded. And... Um, it, it doesn't take much to figure out that if you've got a basement full of sewer water that you're, you're not going to be in a particularly good mood. But can we, could we quantify that stress? So we went to, uh, in 2014 in Burlington, so just an hour and a half uh, west of Toronto, uh, in 2014 in Burlington, there was a major precipitation event whereby about 195 millimeters of rain came down over an 8 or 10 hour period. In other words, just a deluge of rain came down over 10 hours. And it flooded out uh, 3,300 homes in Burlington, which Burlington's not all that big. So that, that's a lot of homes, including, by the way, the mayor's home, who had lived there for 28 years, never seen a drop of water in his basement. And now all of a sudden he had five and a half feet of sewer water, of water in his basement. We went back to Burlington uh, three years later to run a survey going door to door of homes that were flooded versus homes that weren't flooded three years prior to that time. And the survey, basically what it came down to is we were looking for um, uh, uh, quantifying the, the, the stress people feel every time there's a major precipitation event, a major storm, and compare that stress between homes that have been flooded three years earlier versus those that weren't. And I thought that this uh, survey would not go anywhere. I thought, Nobody is going to fill out, uh, respond to a survey of somebody walking to their door on, you know, a nice Saturday afternoon. Who, who's going to even participate? Turns out I couldn't have been more wrong. Every door that the surveyors went to, uh, and, and we even had to change the design because at first we had one person knocking on the door. Uh, not only were they receptive, they were inviting almost in every single case that a home was flooded, inviting the person into the house, down into the basement, and wanted to show them the watermark on the wall where the flooding had occurred, and then booted up their computer to show them pictures of all the stuff that they had to put out in the boulevard that had been flooded. So we had to change the experimental design right away because for safety reasons, we couldn't have someone going down into someone's basement. You, you never see them again, right? And, uh, uh, but anyhow, what it amounted to in quantification, on a scale of zero to five, five being the most stress you could feel, for people that experience a flooded basement, 48% of them rank themselves as a 4.5 to five out of five in terms of the stress they feel every single time there's a major precipitation event. And this was three years later. In other words, this is now how they live. And they would use statements like, uh, every time it rains, my husband and I are up three times during the night checking the basement for water. Or the kids get home from school and if it's raining all day, the first thing they do is go down in the basement and see is there any water in the basement. So now what we're doing 
is actually quantifying uh, elevations in prescription medications to deal with psychosocial and mental health stress and escalated counseling services, increases in uh, prescriptions for counseling services for people who have to put up with this stuff or have gone through this situation. So the point is, this should convince you of the reality of climate change, the magnitude of the impact, um, and uh, the fact, you know, it, it's simply not going to go away. Uh, next slide, please. So now, we get more positive. The question is, what do we do all about all this stuff? Well, in Canada, over the last 10, 12 years, we haven't just been sitting our hands doing nothing. Uh, we've been developing standards and guidelines that can be implemented to mitigate risk. And the risks that we focus on, or our group with a lot of others, focus on flood, wildfire, and extreme heat. Uh, there's a longer list of perils, but th these are the ones that I happen to know a, a fair bit about. So what we've developed over time, in the left-hand side of the screen for flooding, we have standards now for the country that describe what do we do at the level of the house? What actions can we take around the outside of the property and the basement itself to make it such that when the big storms hit, the probability of ending up with a basement full of water is much lower? We have standards and guidelines for how do you build new communities going forward such that when the big storms hit, the community isn't flooded out. For existing communities, like where we are right now, uh, what actions can be taken to mitigate flood risk at the community level by putting in place berms, diversion channels, holding ponds, uh, restoration, retention and restoration of natural infrastructure to give place of water a place to go and be held safely. For commercial real estate, uh, what can we do for commercial real estate to make it such when the big storms hit, the underground parking lots don't fill with, with water? Uh, and by the way, the we here in developing any of these reports that you, you see here, generally speaking, this, is, this involves bringing about 60 to 80 people together from all across Canada or beyond. It's builders, developers, designers, architects, uh, planners, insurance people, indigenous peoples, NGOs, academics, whoever has expertise that should be brought to the table to figure out what do we do to, to mitigate risk, that's who we bring together. So it's not like you know six people sitting at the University of Waterloo doing this in a, in a vacuum. Um, and uh, you know part of my job is to know everybody in the country that has expertise in a particular area. And by the way, even for the Intex Center, working on adaptation, one of my biggest problems is I cannot hire people. I cannot find people who understand climate change, extreme weather risk, and multiple dimensions, and then work towards building practical solutions. So part of my reason here tonight is to, to fill this void. And uh, so that's for flood. Then we have similar, oh, and what we also do, let's, and you'll see this in a second, but for that report in the upper left-hand corner, that's 80 pages in length, and, and it focuses on uh, flood risk mitigation at the level of the home. However, after having been in front of hundreds and hundreds of ministers, deputy ministers, mayors, counselors, you name it, developers, uh, when you write these reports, all of which are user-friendly, smart kid in grade 10 could read them and understand them, uh, one thing I've learned over the years is people don't read reports, period. They don't read them. They like to know they're there, but they don't like to read them. So what we do, what we have found is we take the messaging in that report, say the upper left-hand corner, that uh, describes in 80 pages, this is what you do and why you do it to mitigate flood risk at the level of the home. We've distilled the messaging down to a single page infographic, in this case, and you'll see it in the next slide, but with 15 diagrams on it that are instantaneously understandable in terms of what it's telling you to, uh, as to how to mitigate flood risk at the level of the home. And indeed, these things are so effective that when you're meeting with a minister or a deputy minister or prime minister or whoever it happens to be, uh, a corporate leader, and you hand one of these infographics out during the meeting, you almost can't have the meeting because they just stare at this sheet of paper the whole time you're there. And about two minutes later, they go, I got to do six of these things around my house this weekend, you know, type of thing. So uh, we've distilled messaging down to simple messaging, which works very effectively. Uh, we've done the same thing for wildfire, that uh, report in the middle on uh, uh, how to mitigate wildfire risk at the level of the home and the community. We released that about 
uh, maybe eight months ago or something, I can't quite remember. Every one of these reports, when we release them, they draw a mammoth amount of attention. We end up doing about 150 media interviews on them with CBC, CTV, Global News, you, you name it. Uh, we have uh, guidance for extreme heat. How do we pair, prepare for extreme heat in the country and things are gonna get a lot hotter? And then, as uh, Luigi was talking about earlier, we do a lot of work, and there's a lot of people in this country working on this, is how to re retain and restore natural infrastructure as a, as a means to mitigate flood risk and extreme heat, amongst other benefits. And by the way, we're losing natural infrastructure very, very rapidly uh, in this country. As a general rule of thumb, uh, and by the way, by natural infrastructure, I mean forest fields, wetlands. The, uh, as a general rule of thumb, for the southern reaches of provinces across the country, over the last 100 years, we've lost on average about 60 to 80% of the natural infrastructure that was originally here, it's now gone. It's either paved over or turned into some form of uh, agricultural production. In Ontario, over the last 100 years, we've lost about 72 to 73% of the natural infrastructure that was originally here. It's now paved over or turned into agricultural uh, uh, production. And during precipitation events, when water comes down and hits pavement, it doesn't hang on the landscape very long. It runs off immediately to the lowest place around and contributes to flood risk. And I've mentioned, we've talked about the health impacts and I won't go into it here, but I just make you aware of the fact that we work a lot with banks and institutional investors to factor physical climate risk into institutional investment decision making or how do pensions, uh, the major pension funds invest their money and how do they take climate change and extreme weather risk into account. And by the way, they need people like you to be able to judge the degree to which mitigation efforts are meaningful. They have to turn to the expertise of people like those in this room. Uh, next slide, please. Now, when we wrote that report on uh, flood risk, the before writing it, we went into about 700 homes in New Brunswick, Quebec, Ontario, and Saskatchewan, and we spent about an hour and a half to three and a half hours per home uh, um, uh, looking at uh, or assessing the degree to which there were actions that could be taken around the outside of the property or in the basement itself to mitigate flood risk. And what we found was astounding that the number of deficiencies for homes that predisposed them to realize flooding. Uh, in response to that, we wrote that major report you saw on the previous page, but we brought it down to this simple infographic, which we're using as a communications vehicle now to uh, with, with homeowners across the country. This, is going, this sheet of paper is going out now to about 3.2 million homes twice per year to give people guidance on how to mitigate flood risk in their homes. And it's hitting about uh, 7 million Canadians in total. Uh, along the, and the details here don't matter, but along the top row are actions that can be taken around the home generally speaking over, a, over a, a long weekend without special expertise for very little money that can lower the chances that when a big storm event hits, your basement won't fill with water. And it's actions as simple as say the, the, the fourth box over, test your sub pump. And just to illustrate how easy solutions can be implemented, um, in the basement of a home, if you go down into the basement, in many basements, what you'll see is there, uh, below the basement floor, you'll see a, what looks like a bucket uh, sitting in the ground, and there will be a pump in there. And if water gets into the basement of the house, it goes into this uh, well, it's called a sump well, collects there, and there's a pump in there that pumps the water outside. So that's a good thing to happen. One of the things you want to do is check before the storms occur, does the sub pump actually work? In other words, take five or 10 minutes out, with a bucket of water, pour it in the sump well and see if the pump turns on and pumps water outside. If it does, that's good. If it doesn't, you wanna replace it before the big storms hit. And the um, uh, most people find out that their sub pump is seized when they have four and a half feet of sewer water in the basement. But through this simple action, that action alone can be one of the things that saves you from having a flooded basement. Similarly, 
If you go down to the, the bottom right-hand corner, these are things just get a little bit more expensive, but very straightforward to mitigate risk. In the lower right-hand corner, again, just sticking with the sub-pump example, you want to make sure that you have electricity supply to run the sub-pump when the big storms hit. Because the time you need the sub-pump to work is when the big storms hit. Very often when the big storms hit, the electricity goes out, so now it's non-functional. So you want to make sure that you have back backup battery supply to run the sump pump for a period of two to three days in the event the electricity goes out. So these simple actions are now being communicated to mitigate flood risk with homeowners uh, across Canada. Uh, next slide, please. And, and I won't go into any details on this, but just sticking with flood, and then we'll say something about wildfire and extreme heat. Uh, we're also looking at how we build new communities going forward in such a way that when the big storms hit, they don't all flood out. And it starts with number one, don't build on a floodplain. Or if you do build on a floodplain, make sure you put all the measures in place that uh, will make it such that when the big storms hit, the homes don't flood out. Uh, we want to uh, uh, retain and restore natural infrastructure to bring nature into community development to give water a place to go when the big storms hit. It also supports biodiversity, it sequesters carbon, and it adds to the aesthetics of communities. So we, we need a concerted effort to retain and restore natural infrastructure, not just in Ontario, but across the country. And then we can also use those structures, uh, uh, berms, diversion channels, holding ponds, cisterns, physical structures working with nature to mitigate flood risk. This is the stuff that when we do it, we will retain the insurability of the housing market going forward. And if not, uh, the costs are gonna be uh, uh, more dire than we're realizing now. And the importance of this is, when you think about it, for a great many people, when they own a house, they will get up every day for 30 years, 25 or 30 years of their life, to earn money to pay for a house. And yet, people put more effort into planning their vacations than they put, do into planning or looking at how do I protect this investment, which is my retirement plan, most likely, from uh, these types of impacts. So, and what we found is when you give this information to homeowners, they act. Within six months, 70% of homeowners will take two to three actions they otherwise wouldn't have taken to mitigate flood risk. The reason they're not acting now is that they don't know what to do. Uh, next, next slide, please. Now, I want to just change channels and talk about wildfire risk. The, and, and you all saw last summer the wildfires that were on the news almost nightly in um, Alberta, uh, British Columbia, and to some degree uh, Nova Scotia. But wildfire risk, for sure, is going to get more challenging in this country and globally going forward, driven by four factors. Increases in temperatures. Canada's average temperature has increased by 1.7 degrees Celsius over the period 1948 to more or less the present. The present, the further north you go, the greater the temperature in the increase is. We have driven by warming on the planet. We have a weaker jet stream that can result in heat domes occurring, areas of pockets of very warm air, almost like somebody's holding the pot on a, uh, the, the lid on a pot on a stove, holding warm air in place in one location over an extended uh, period of time, contributing to wildfire risk. Lightning activity goes up with increasing temperature and about 50% of wildfires in Canada are caused by lightning strikes. And then we have overall drier soils and, and more forest diseases impacting uh, the, the, the health of, of trees, killing them and cre creating basically fuel for fires. For a whole bunch of reasons, wildfire risk is gonna get more challenging in Canada going forward. Uh, next slide, please. What we've developed, and, and the, the purpose here is not to go into the details, but to let you know that it exists and we need more of this. Uh, we released this report uh, December of last year uh, uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, December of last year, wildfire ready, practical guidance to strengthen the resilience of Canadian homes and communities. In this picture on the front cover, the homes that are standing here put in place the measures that are described to mitigate wildfire risk on the uh, infographic to the right. Those homes did, these homes did what this chart uh, says should be done to mitigate fire risk at the level of the home. These homes didn't do it, and they're gone. 
So the, um, uh, so the actions on the right-hand side, again, it follows the same pattern as what we saw for flooding. And by the way, actions to mitigate wildfire risk can be a very simple along the top row. It's things like if you have shrubbery around your home, uh, remove the shrubs for a distance of about one and a half meters from the wall of the house. Because otherwise, uh, the, what, when wildfire comes into a region, the shrubs ignite, they burn, and the heat transfers through the wall of the house into the house, and the house burns down. Or if you have firewood, don't store it at the back door of the house for convenience. Get it away from the house. If you have a wooden fence around your house, replace it with chain length, a chain length fence, because with a wooden fence, the, the wood ignites and it just follows the fence right up to the house and the house burns down. In the lower left-hand corner, we want to make sure that the roofs of houses have what are called class A fire-resistant roof covering, cement, fiber, metal, or asphalt shingles. They're such that when embers land on them, the roof won't ignite and the house won't burn down. 50 to 90% of homes burn down uh, during wildfires because embers travel a huge distance through the air, drop down on somebody's house, and it's got uh, uh, shingles of a type or needles on the roof of the house or even wooden uh, cedar shingles. Uh, the roof catches fire and the house burns down. My point is there's things we can do to mitigate the losses, and now we're doing them rapidly. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally... Uh, to talk about extreme heat, it's gonna get a lot hotter in Canada going forward. As a general rule of thumb, between now and 2050 to 2080, the maximum summer temperature that uh, uh, we realize in major, major cities across the country is going to increase by about three to five degrees Celsius. So in Toronto right now, we tap out in the summer at about 36, 37 degrees Celsius. That's the, the maximum temperature we hit in, in Toronto in the summer. By 2050 to 2080, that's going to gradually creep up to uh, uh, by about three to five degrees Celsius to maximum uh, summer temperatures in the 40 to 41 degree zone. And the number of hot days per summer, the number of days per summer that the temperature is over 30 degrees Celsius, right now in Toronto, uh, that's about uh, uh, 14, 15 days per summer over 30 degrees Celsius. By 2050 to 2080, that's going to 55 to 60 days per summer over 30 degrees Celsius. So the heat is coming. The manifestation of heat in, uh, in uh, Canada, there are three zones in particular that are going to get very hot going forward. The south central area of British Columbia uh, in the Mountain Valley regions along the U.S. border. That's number one. Number two is the southern regions of the provinces along the U.S. border. And number three is along the north shore of Lake Erie on out through to the St. Lawrence River Valley. These are the areas that are going to realize the greatest increase in extreme heat and, and suffrage associated thereof uh, going forward. The three groups of people who are most vulnerable to extreme heat the number one group, the people who die uh, during extreme heat events, it's the elderly, people over 70 years of age, living alone, who are financially challenged, which is basically a way of saying they probably don't have air conditioning. And there's someone who, uh, they're, they're living in the back of a, of, of a, of a row house somewhere, uh, maybe without a fan or an air conditioner, and, and probably with nobody checking on them. These are the people that are at the greatest risk. Number two is the uh, uh, homeless. And number three are uh, people with pre-existing health conditions that are generally a combination of respiratory and cardiac in, in nature. So one of the things we need to do, for example, um, is to, to mitigate the risk is let's say for the elderly, we need to set up a system whereby ahead of the heat waves, and this could be done whether it's through the United Way or the Salvation Army or uh, some uh, division of, within a municipality or who, who may be wheels on, meals on wheels, we don't know yet. But we have to set up a system for the elderly, the people living alone over 70 years of age, nobody checking on them, probably not, don't have an air conditioner, that somebody is, we know where they are, we've mapped them out, we know where they exist in these buildings, and during the heat wave, somebody is checking on them on a regular basis every day to make sure, are they okay? 
Do they have a fan? Do they have an air conditioner? Are they properly hydrated? Do they need a trip to a cooling center? That uh, uh, sort of activity. Uh, next slide, please. So for extreme heat, uh, we've also developed guidance and, and anything you guys design in terms of buildings, better take this into account. Uh, we, we, we know how to design at the level of the home and the level of the community to mitigate uh, problems, per, challenges pertaining to extreme heat. And for example, on this infographic, the upper left hand corner, that's the checking on vulnerable neighbors, knowing who they are, who's checking on them during heat waves. Uh, heat alerts go out ahead of time to allow people to get out of harm's way if they're susceptible to extreme heat. Somewhere they're gonna be cool and, and not suffer greatly during uh, extreme heat events. We can have passive cooling on buildings such that we have on a, a glazing on windows that attenuate sunlight so it won't pass into a building uh, contributing to heat. We can have mechanical shutters. We can have awnings on windows to keep sunlight out. If you go to Europe, by the way, not too long ago, I was in Italy uh, and uh, uh, Turkey, and all the apartment buildings are built with these features in place, or almost all. Um, we also, though, in the lower right-hand corner, we need to think about access to cooling as a fundamental human right. The same way we look at access to warming in the winter to keep people safe and out of harm's way and they don't freeze to death, People can come into harm's way. They can die just as quickly in the summer due to extreme heat. So we have to think of access to cooling as a fundamental human right, having one cool room in the living quarters where someone lives, which means either an air conditioner or a heat pump or some other technology to, to cool down at least one room uh, for people that are under, uh, particularly when they live in apartment buildings that are 40 years of age or older, which probably means that they don't have central air conditioning. Uh, and then buildings themselves, we need more buildings with white roofs versus the dark color of roofs that we normally see if you fly into Toronto, you look down, you see almost every roof is dark. We need white roofs called cool roofs that are such that when sunlight hits that white roof, most of the energy backs up, uh, bounces back up into space versus the heat being staying in the system if you have the dark roofs of, of tar. We need cool pavements. We need more uh, areas within cities, parks, recreational areas where people can go into where they have shade trees to get out of the sunlight, to get respite from the uh, direct sun. This is all action that we're undertaking uh, right now. Uh, next slide, please. And this is my last point. Uh, in Canada, we launched the National Adaptation Strategy, as I mentioned at the beginning uh, last year. This is it. My suggestion to you is you become very familiar with it. You know, I, 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 I pretty much carry this thing around like the Gutenberg Bible. And there are 26 targets in it uh, with short-term time frames as to commitments Canada will make, is making, to deal with flood, wildfire, and extreme heat. And what's good about this report is that uh, Minister Gilbo, the Minister of Environment, he isn't looking at preparedness for flood, wildfire, and extreme heat as solely the domain or the responsibility of the federal government. This is an all hands on deck approach. It's federal government, pro uh, provincial governments, municipal governments, it's industry, it's academe, it's everybody making a contribution to the realization of these targets. One example, there's eight targets in this report that are very much in the wheelhouse of the Intact Center. So we're working on those eight targets for the federal government to make them happen, or at least that's who we report back to. One, one, two examples of the targets are, one is, by so this is in this report, there's 26 altogether. By 2025, which is almost now, 50% of Canadians have taken concrete actions to better prepare for and respond to climate change risks facing their household. Well, this is flood, wildfire, and extreme heat. This is, all the stuff I just talked about is going into this to make this happen. Uh, by 2030, 80% of public and municipal organizations have factored climate change adaptation into their decision-making processes. The skill sets of you people that you're developing right now, I see as directly applicable to the realization of these targets and a lot of other targets uh, in, in the national adaptation strategy. Become familiar with them and then think, okay, where are the areas that with my expertise I can make a contribution? So. And then my last point is success is in the planning. We get calls, like whenever there's a flood, wildfire, 
extreme heat event, whatever it might be, going on somewhere in the country or, or abroad, we know for sure we're going to get CBC, CTV, Global News, they're all going to call. Like you're going to just do interviews for the next two days. When you're doing those interviews, one of the, the question they always ask, well, there's three, there's two sets. If relative to climate change, they want to know, is this climate change? Is it going to get worse? And what do we do about it? That's pretty much the, the pattern of the questions. But um, but they also ask is these homes are burning down in West Kelowna, or people, four people just drowned in Nova Scotia during this flood event. What do we do about it? There's not much you can do. When the house is on fire or you know, there's water flooding through, through it, there's not much you can do. Everything is in the preparedness. It's the preparedness that counts. Uh, the, the degree of impact is determined before the event ever occurs if you prepare. We've, and for Canada, on climate change, it's a good news, bad news story. The good news is we know what the problems are. We know where they're going to manifest. And we know to a very large degree what the solutions are. The part we're not doing is mobilizing known solutions. That's the problem. The problem is going up like on this line. We're keeping up on this line and the dispersion between these lines is increasing. We've got to mobilize known solutions much more rapidly. And quite frankly, I see that as your job. That's what you need to be able to do. You need to be able to implement solutions in a timely fashion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.